Welcome back to Huchos. Today on Huchos, I'm taking you on a full run through of the operation of my nutrient film technique hydroponic system. This includes my plumbing layout, channel and pump cleaning, nutrient mixing, as well as pH balancing for when I'm changing the reservoir, uh, adjusting my flow rate, propagation prep and planting into and a bunch more tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years with my nutrient film technique system. I'll put timestamps below so that you can jump around and look at the parts that you're interested in. Let's get started. So the greenhouse is in a bit of disarray at the moment. There's a heap of nutrient deficiencies. Some plants are bolting where I should have harvested them ages ago. Plants flowering. I've got pests, infestations. I want to clean up this whole area and I want to take you along for the ride because I think I want you to see the maintenance required on an NFT essentially. So in the system at the moment, we've got these are the sugar loaf cabbages. These will be staying. I've got some rocket here, which is bolting at the moment. Well, it's beyond bolting actually, it's flowering. I've got a ton of cos, uh, which is bolting. This is just bok choy, but you can see here some nutrient deficiencies in the leaves. This is, I'm pretty sure this is because my nutrient solution, it's very low. Uh, we're down to about 150 liters maybe. And I'll tend to have this uh, all the way up as high as I can. So over here, uh, we've got some more rocket. Um, which is also flowering. You can see evidence of pests in the greenhouse here. Uh, we've got a heap of cos, which is bolting. It's just been so hot. Uh, all these plants are well and truly past their prime. You can see here where like we've got some of them are just so large they're just falling over in the system, but you can just pop them back up like so. I was testing a method similar to the cotton wool method where I had cocoa instead in those little plugs. So you can see here that we have a cocoa plug where I planted this bok choy and that works just fine if you don't like the cotton wool method. We are going to go through the cotton wool method a little bit later in this video, but first I want to remove all of the plants in the system that are showing signs of pest infestation and nutrient deficiency. I'm also going to remove most of the bolting plants. I'll leave the plants that I can still make use of. So these ones here, but you can see I've just got a ton of pests. They've just been let go a little bit wild, which is not ideal and I wouldn't recommend doing that. I actually had a time-lapse camera on for these plants and they were all doing extremely well. The main problem I actually have with this system is I probably have too many plants for my requirements at home. I make meals for one person, which I could probably survive off like half or a quarter of what I have here. And that actually means the rest end up just being this mass of plants that don't get utilized and they become like a breeding ground for pests that get in. Especially like I find that because I don't have any flying pests, but things like these aphids, they get brought in by ants and the ants are drawn to not only the plants, but the water in the nutrient solution because um, it's just so dry here at the moment. Beyond putting like some really intense insecticide barrier around the greenhouse, I'm not quite sure how to stop that happening. Now, if you wanted to, and I do this semi-regularly, I let some of the plants go to flower and this one's gone to flower. This is a red oak leaf lettuce. And you can see here within these flowers, these are the seeds. You can actually just cut the top of the flower once it gets to this stage, put it upside down in some kind of bucket, let it dry out and collect the seeds. And that will just save you money on purchasing seeds. This is how I manage my seeds. So I'm just gonna chuck this into a bucket and then once it's dry, collect all the seeds from the flowers. So let's get rid of the infested and nutrient deficient plants. Wow. <laughs> and you can see here what I'm talking about with the ant problem. All the ants just scurrying away because there was a ton of aphids just on one of those leaves and 
That's what they've been doing. And here again, that's the cocoa right at the base of the plant. You can see there. So the cocoa method uh, works absolutely fine and none of this cocoa gets sent down into the res because it's all just within the roots of the plant. And the same here again. They're gonna have an absolute ball. <laughs> okay, so this isn't something that I necessarily do every time. Sometimes I'll just empty the system out and replace the plants in it. But because there was so many pests on the system this time, I wanna give it a nice clean because there might be some eggs and there's a lot of just, it's just pretty dirty at the moment. So I kinda of wanna clean it. Um, I don't particularly worry about inside the channels, but this is where the design of system comes into play because I've got live plants in this row, so I won't be taking that off, but I wanna take these two rows off. Down here, I've got the feeders for the system and they have taps on them. So I can just turn the taps off, um, which stops the flow to these channels so I don't have to stop that channel running. Uh, and I can just pull out uh, my 13 millimeter tubing out of my 13 millimeter holes. And this allows me to just remove the whole channel like so and take it out for cleaning. And I've done this all without stopping the pump at all. And I can do the same on this side where I've got some plants that I wanna keep in the back row again. To clean the channels, I just use 70% ethanol alcohol solution. But if it's too expensive because you aren't able to make it yourself, just use bleach. Bleach is absolutely fine. Uh, just a household dilution, I think it's like 12.5%. Spray it on, use the proper PPE. Just make sure whatever you're using, you're washing off with water afterwards so that it doesn't get into your hydroponic nutrient, obviously. Don't worry too much about the inside of the channels unless you've got like a channel that can open up. I've never ever fully cleaned these like to like sparkling clean and I really don't have any root rot issues. Don't stress, plants traditionally are grown in dirt which is quite dirty. We don't need a sterile environment here. We're just trying to reset the system, removing as many pests and pathogens as we possibly can, removing any vectors for the transmission of anything nasty from the last crop to the next crop. So I'm just gonna wipe these down and try and remove any mold. I mean, just a soapy water solution will do just fine as well. And that's really all we're trying to achieve. Uh, you can see, the difference between the old channels and the clean channels. So not perfect, like I'm not being pedantic, just trying to get them presentable again. I'm also just gonna do the best I can to give these ones a bit of a clean as well, even though I can't take them out for a clean. And I'm doing this before we change the reservoir. So it's probably a good time to show you how the plumbing is sort of run because I've had a few people ask how I've run my plumbing. I've got a large pump in here that runs to a T-piece and the T-piece runs out the top of my IBC, which is about 700 liters, and down to a tap, uh, which controls all three inlets going into the NFT. These are all tapped as well. It just means that I can control the flow to all of them as well as individually. So I can really dial in each channel to the flow rate that I want. And it's the same on the other side. So it comes down to, there's a tap in the middle and it comes down to our three taps, uh, which is actually four taps. I use these as uh, watering can fillers uh, and stuff like that. So at the moment, the nutrient, so I'll explain my nutrient change schedule or lack thereof very soon. So the nutrient is, at a pH of about 6.9, and it is an EC of 2.3. So the EC is a bit high for what I'd like. This nutrient hasn't been changed, fully changed, in like six months, but it has been topped up regularly. This is like my big clean out, I guess you'd call it. When the nutrient gets down to the height it's at now, it's about 150 or 200 liters, I'll fill it back up, all the way up to like six, 700 liters and then I'll add in the nutrient 
for the amount that I've filled up. So I would add in like 400 liters worth of nutrient, which is about one gram per liter of my Diamond Spec T and one gram per liter of the Nitro Cal, but halved because we're dealing with leafy greens. That's gonna give me a nutrient strength of about one to 1.5. That's just a top up. I usually top this system up. I rarely empty it out completely and start again. But you saw with some of the plants earlier that they were showing signs of nutrient deficiency. And that is because I really need to change this reservoir. That two point something EC would be a buildup of some nutrients and a lack of other nutrients over six months worth of top up refills. That EC, it only tells you the total amount of nutrients in there, not which nutrients are missing or which nutrients are in excess. And excess of one nutrient can lock out another nutrient. It just starts to really snowball when you get to a really old nutrient solution. I'm just going to empty this out. We can start the nutrient solution over again. But as I said, you do not need to do this every single time. This is like a once in, well, over summer, probably once in three months solution for me. And over winter, I can go a whole six months. So I'll probably only empty out the res maybe like four or five times in a year, more during the summer, less during the winter. And that is just sort of based on my observations of the plants and how the system's running at the time. It's also good to empty it out because as you can see, as you can see down the bottom here, we have, we have a buildup of like a sludge and that is a mixture of precipitated nutrients. So a nutrient that is reacted in solution and fallen out of solution. Also just organic matter from the roots of the plants, the grow media, many, many different things. Uh, it also doesn't help that. I've been running this top bed on and off, which would have some debris in it, and that would be falling down through the belsa into the reservoir. So I would definitely wait until afternoon or night time if you're going to turn off your pump. And we will need to turn off the pump to do a full changeover to wash out the res and start again, because we don't want that pump running dry. I'm gonna turn off the pump. It's 2.15, and I've actually got some shade coming in from some of the gum trees that block the light uh, of my greenhouse, which I actually am grateful for. That is gonna give the plants a little bit of a respite from the sun while I've not got much water and nutrient to work with. You don't wanna extend this process any longer than it needs to take. You're not really rushing so much as you're just trying to work as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm gonna turn off the pump, empty out the res, then we can get to refilling it, at which point when the pump is submerged, you can run the system again. So off goes the pump and we can open the outlet. This is about 150 liters worth of nutrients, so not much at all. It's just gonna run onto my grass and make it really green. Just using a hose or something, we kind of wanna stir up that mess at the bottom so it exits out through our drain. I'm just going to Use my hose to stir it up. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to get the pump. This is the pump, it's the AP3000. It's maximum flow of 2,800 liters an hour. This is way overkill for most people. Uh, you'd be better off using the pumps that I'll link in the descriptions because they're way cheaper. They have a high flow rate and you're probably not going to have a system that is this large. Take the front off my pump. Uh, this is where the filter is, like so. And you can see how disgusting that is. I'm just going to wash that off and we're going to do a little bit of pump maintenance. So what we want to do is we want to remove the front of the pump like so and pull this out. Now this is, this is the impeller and you can see how it's all gunked up. This is just a magnet that is turned by the pump and you can see here where it slides in um, and it's, it's just full of gunk and I'm gonna clean that out as best I can. And once you're happy with it, you can just slide it back in like so and place the front back on like so. And this is where you adjust your flow rate. So you can just have it completely open or completely closed. Completely closed is higher flow and completely open uh, is lower flow. So I have it somewhere in the middle. Place our filter back on the front 
and place a cover back over. See, there's nothing to be afraid of inside that pump. It all just comes apart and goes back together and it's made to do that. The maintenance is simple and it's gonna save you a lot of money if you do perform that quick maintenance check every you know, few months. Okay, hook that pump back up like so. Pop it down. You can see our res is looking better already. Um, I'm just going to use the hose to get the last bit of trash out of the bottom. So I'm pretty happy with that amount of cleaning. I'm gonna close the drain and we can, and I can refill it with the float valve. So, drain off, refill on. And I can just leave that now. As soon as the water is like a couple of inches above the pump, I'll start running the system so that our plants aren't just sitting uh, without any water. Then when it's filled right up, we can do the next step, which is balancing the pH and adding in the nutrient. We're almost full. Uh, my water is rainwater. It comes off the roof of my house, down the pipes, and through a leaf eater, which strains out the leaves and particulate, under some charged pipes, which come from both sides of the house. And I also have catchment on the studio, which also drops through a leaf eater. And into these two, about 27,000 liter rainwater tanks. Uh, and this supplies all the water for my house and hydroponics as well. So I've got about 330 square meters of catchment on the roof of the house and the roof of the studio, which equals about thousand liters every three mils of precipitation or rain. So the pipes come from the corner of the house on both sides and the shed and drop down into this pipe system, which is fully charged. The water level is right up to the top of the pipe at the end and it just drops into my tank. You can see the water there. And there's my pump and my bladder system. And this supplies me with a nice clean slate for my nutrient solution because there's no dissolved minerals in this whatsoever. So if you're on town water or using a hard water supply or using a bore, you may have a different water starting point to me because I do have rainwater as my nutrient solution base. So my nutrients are going to be available online very shortly and they'll be available in the link of every single video that I make and I'm making them available to you. Just hold out for that announcement. They're probably already in the description if this video is any age at all. I store my nutrients in containers like these. These containers are sealed lid. They have a seal around the edge. And the reason for this is because the nutrient will absorb moisture from the atmosphere if they're not in a sealed container. So I keep my nutrient in sealed containers. I just use a scoop that I have in both of my containers and I just use that um, to scoop the nutrient. I just measure out in separate containers. Because we're going for a leafy greens nutrient, uh, I'm just going to use half strength. So one half gram per liter of water for both the Diamond Spec T and the Nitro Cow. So for say 700 liters of water, that would be 350 grams of the Diamond Spec T and 350 grams of the Nitro Cow. So I'm going to measure that out into any bucket, uh, black ones are preferable because you can actually see the nutrient mix, but I just use these white ones. And it doesn't have to be perfect. 370 grams, that'll be absolutely fine. And I'll do exactly the same of the other. So the Nitro Cal, 360 grams, perfect, good enough. And I'm just gonna stir these up with hot water. The hot water is just going to help the nutrient dissolve. And while I'm here, I'm going to weigh out my pH adjustment as well. So this is potassium carbonate. Uh, it is way cheaper than purchasing your standard pH rays. This is also going to be available in bulk dry form to you very soon in the same place as the nutrients. Just have a look in the description at the end of the video. So it will actually depend on how your nutrient reacts to your water and what pH your water is starting at as to whether you'll need pH up or down. I'm gonna be covering pH completely in a separate video in the not too distant future. For the potassium carbonate, uh, it's one gram per 100 liters when it's at full strength nutrient. I'm gonna add in three and a half grams and I think these scales are gonna be not 
accurate enough. We're up to four grams. Four grams will be fine. Four grams replaces what would be 40 mils of the pH rays. So I'm just gonna mix that into water and we can add this in first. The float valve has stopped the tap running, which is important because I guarantee you, you will leave this running and if you're like me and have tanks, that is the worst thing in the world. Turn this off, unplug it. The amount that you need to pre-adjust your nutrient is going to be based on your water and your nutrients. So don't just take this and apply it to your water because it's gonna be different. That's the one thing I can't really give you an answer for. You're gonna have to add in your nutrient the first time and see how much you need to adjust it based on your water and nutrient. Take a note of it, how much you've adjusted, and then just pre-adjust the water next time at the exact same rate as last time. Not much should have changed. Full strength nutrient will change your pH more than half strength nutrient, which is why you kind of have to adjust it dependent on the strength of the nutrient. Now, the reason we add it in first is because if you were to add into pre-made nutrient solution, it just makes pockets of really high pH and causes the nutrient to, to precipitate out of solution, which is what we're trying to avoid by adding this in first. And there we go. Just before we add the nutrient in, it's gonna give you a reading on the water. pH is seven. Yeah, 6.9. So I'm just gonna add in my nitrocal first. And my diamond spec T. And just give it a bit of a mix. Okay, so our pH is six. So we're looking for 5.5 .5 to 6.5, which is, six is perfect. Uh, millisiemens, one. So we're going one to 1.5 and one's perfect as well. Uh, so this is really good for summer as well because um, the plants will be transpiring more. So a lower nutrient is a better nutrient. Fantastic, I'm happy with that. And we can turn on the pump. Our pump's running again. Uh, that's running too fast for what I'd like in this channel. However, these channels are turned off. So more pressure is going through that one. So let's add back in our other channels. And we can place our feeder lines back into the ends. So the flow rate that I'm trying to achieve at the ends here is something like this. It's enough nutrient to make a film across the entire base of the pipe, but not so much that it backs up. So the main thing to remember here is to keep it a nutrient film and we don't want any real depth to the channel at all. And we can do that at the other end too. So I like to, at this point, I like to open them right up so you can get like a full flow and that'll clear it out a little bit. And then we can dial it back. Um, and I just put that one in there for now because we're gonna grab the other one and open it up. See all that gunk? We can get that out. And I'll show you what I mean. Like, as you adjust the flow rate on one, it's going to affect the other. So what we want to do is we want to dial them back to like that. Then we can turn this one back down and turn this one up a little bit until we're happy with the flow rate across all the channels. And within the reservoir, it's gonna look like this. So all of our channels are sort of flowing at the same rate. And when you're happy with all of them, it is then time to fill up our system with plants. And it's the perfect time of the afternoon for it. It's like quarter to four, 20 to four. Um, the sun's only losing intensity now. So the plants will have a whole night to acclimatize and it's gonna be bloody hot tomorrow. So I wanna give them as much time as possible. So let's get our plants. Here I have all the plants that I'm gonna be planting today. I've utilized a few of them already for other systems, but they've all been raised in this DIY propagation shelving unit. And I'll leave a link in the description and up here for that video. This technique is my favorite technique. It's really, really cheap. You can use cocoa in these trays as well. I've just found that the cotton wool holds onto water better. It doesn't dry out as quickly, as easily. From right to left, uh, this is Merlot purple Chinese cabbage. These were all just planted in 
sort of a checker spacing. I've got Cos, a Matilda Chinese cabbage. The Chinese cabbage have these spines on the leaves, as you can see. They're gonna grow up into something that I can make into kimchi, which I'm really excited to do. The Matilda is like a green Chinese cabbage and the uh, Merlot is the purple over here, which I'm very excited for. And on the left here, we have rosy pak choy. The Koz and the pak choy have outpaced the Chinese cabbage. I'll be taking note of that and in the future I might plant them in different trays um, because I'm happy with the size of the Chinese cabbage but these ones are slightly larger than I'd probably like and they're sort of intermingled which is going to make them a bit of a hassle to pull apart. So this is kind of where the no media uh, NFT design really comes into its own because you can just drop the plants in without any media except for the cost of like the, the cotton wool. You do need tweezers for this process. Pull the cotton wool out with um, the plant attached. You literally just drop the cotton wool onto the base of the NFT rail and the cotton wool, it would just allow the water to wet the cotton wool and the plant's roots will grow out from the cotton wool. This just mediates the plant's growth from a media base, which is what it's used to with the cotton wool, and allows it to just utilize the bottom of the channel and the nutrient film as its nutrient and water source. And we can just do that for the rest of our plants. And you can see with the cos, how the cos has sprouted into the cotton wool and its roots have made its way out into the bottom of the seedling tray. These smaller cells are really good because they fit the cotton wool really like perfectly. I'd recommend not putting like more than two seeds into each cotton wool because it just means that you don't have to thin out too much. But if you do need to thin out, we can just pull the cotton wool apart uh, like so and utilize it like that. We can just separate the cotton wool out because I don't actually think I'm gonna have enough seedlings for all of these. So I'm trying to get as many plants as I possibly can into the NFT. With the smaller plants, it's absolutely fine if they don't reach out of the top of the hole because what will happen is it'll be shaded everywhere else and they'll grow towards the light and up and out of the hole. And I'm gonna leave a couple of these with two in them. I can harvest one prematurely and then I can come along and harvest the second one later. I leave the ones with doubles in the front so that I can see them and pick them out easily. Okay, so we're pretty much all full. I've got a couple of plant spacings left, you can see here and here, um, but I'm actually quite happy because I've managed to keep all of the plant types um, similarly grouped. And there it is. So in about a week or two's time, I'll plant some seeds to replace these guys into the cotton wool technique. This is very dependent on your habits of, you know, eating, how much you eat, how big the system is. You can organize the way that you plant. Just observe your system, observe your habits and adjust your planting style and your planting cycle to your own situation. This nutrient is going to last a long time. I don't really check the nutrient after I've set it. I just check its level. And then once it's getting low, I will just add in fresh nutrient. I check it probably every second top up. It probably seems quite careless, but I've got a feel for this system over the years and I really don't need to check it. It's a large reservoir. The larger the reservoir, the less maintenance. Uh, that's why I use the 700 liters because I can go like one or two months without topping it up and just irregularly checking it, making sure that it's not running dry. I can maintain it without much thought at all. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Who Chose. I hope I've clarified for some people parts of the process that I hadn't highlighted in the past and I wish you a happy hydroponicking. I will see you next time on Who Chose. <laughs> all right, we're done here. <laughs>